My uh, eighth grade English teacher, Mr. McAllister, made us memorize the poem If by Rudyard Kipling. So I give thanks to Rudyard, never wondering whether or not he would ever approve of this, but I repeat the first line. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. And that seems to me to fit what goes on in the average law firm and what goes on within the average office of the general counsel. Because we are faced with ethical considerations, many of which have been ably discussed here today. I want to take it to a different level. And I want to refer to our responsibilities, in-house and outside counsel alike, as gatekeepers, of those, of those charged with the responsibility of making sure that our client acts not only ethically, but legally, that we do not ask in-house counsel to take steps which cross the line of the law, and that outside counsel make no similar requests of, of, of uh, inside counsel and vice versa, and that we're mindful of where those lines are. Because I'd like to spend a few minutes today talking about what happens when that line is crossed. And it's not a pretty picture. It's a picture of your name and picture on the front page of the newspaper. And that's the ultimate test at night. Can we put our head on the pillow at night, wondering whether or not, or concerned about whether or not, something that we did during the day will be on the evening news or the front page of the paper. Local lawyers in small towns get into trouble all of the time. Elgin attorney gets jail time for bilking clients. A former attorney from Elgin who took more than $200,000 from his clients was sentenced Wednesday to 180 days in jail. He was handcuffed, taken away from court, and sentenced by the judge who said he was appalled by the lawyer's behavior. Another similar headline, lawyer gets jail time for bilking clients. Here in Indianapolis lawyer and an accountant spent eight years behind bars after admitting to stealing from his clients. This happens in small towns. It happens in large cities. Accountant, theft, lawyer gets jail time for bil bil bilking clients. Indianapolis lawyer and accountant will spend eight years behind bars after admitting taking money from a guardianship account and a family trust account. Stacy Sheedy pleaded guilty to two counts of theft this morning. Prosecutors say one of her victims was a Hamilton County woman living with Alzheimer's. An investigation revealed Sheedy took $596,000 from the woman's guardianship account and another one she managed. Marion County prosecutors spoke with us after the sentencing. I am absolutely offended by individuals who uh, have every opportunity in life, who have education, who have a profession, and, and instead rely upon that to, to exploit uh, vulnerable individuals. And that describes every one of us in this room. We all work very hard for that law degree, and we all have families who want us to, we want to be, have, be proud of us, we want to be proud of them, and we don't want to appear on the evening news like that. Ex-lawyer charged with embezzlement. This is not a small town lawyer. Quote, a former prominent Ch Chicago bankruptcy lawyer was charged Wednesday in federal court with embezzling $570,000 over a three and a half year period while representing creditors in the case of business li liquidation. If convicted, this lawyer was disbarred in 1992, faces up to nine years in prison and a maximum fine of $650,000. Can I see a show of hands, and I'm going to raise mine, of those of you who know a lawyer or a friend in the area of the law who was ever charged with a crime? I do. Almost every hand in this room has gone up, and I expected nothing less, but we deserve much better. It happens in leading American law firms. Headline, a theft scandal ravages a career at a leading American law firm. In the increasingly competitive world of corporate law practice, Gary Fairchild was an expert and evangelist. As the top man in his law firm, one of Chicago's largest firms, he became a regular on the booming management seminar circuit, tirelessly championing notions of, quote, total quality management in what he called the, quote, ACE program, 
short for, quote, above client expectations. He certainly was above client expectations. He was way over the top when it came to client expectations. So it not only happens in the small towns, it happens in the big cities. It happens within the corporate council suite itself. How would you like, as general counsel, to have this headline appear in the newspaper? Former, and then you fill in the name of your company, lawyer indicted for backdating. Quote, the former legal counsel for this company is facing federal charges of improperly backdating stock options at the security software company, close quote. I know that the history of backdating has taken a checkered course through the courts, but just speaking individually and not as a lawyer, who in their right mind would not think twice before approving the backdating of options with an instant profit for the recipient of those options? Who do you go to? Do you remain silent or do you take it up the line? Are we so afraid of our jobs that we don't look higher within the corporation and perhaps get outside counsel to advise us? What's more important, keeping our jobs or losing our freedom? California attorney indicted for obstructing SEC investigation of investment company. We all know, we understand when a subpoena comes in, we're supposed to respond to it. But all too often, we, inside the corporate headquarters, and in the private offices of our choosing, we look for ways to avoid responding to those subpoenas. It's one thing to make proper, obje proper objections. It's quite another to destroy the documents. How many of you have been involved in litigation where you have seen or discovered the destruction of documents or the spoliation of evidence by the other side? Please raise your hands. Several hands go up. Every one of those should have been unnecessary. Law firms send out these articles all of the time. Here's one from the New York Law Journal. Targeting general counsels in stock options backdating actions. Don't say that we haven't all been warned. Quote, new indictment of in-house counsel indicates enhanced efforts to hold corporate executives and lawyers accountable for food and drug law violations. Who can say that we haven't been warned? Here's a local lawyer, Lynn Stewart. She represented a terrorist, the blind sheik, in prison or jail here locally. And she thought that she could bring him more than cookies and cake and do it legally. And here's how she justified her conduct. This is from promotional materials available that she had had placed, or supporters of hers had been placed, had placed on the internet. I'm bringing a sign saying, save the Sixth Amendment. And the Fifth, and the Fourth, and the First. And the First! The Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights, the people's part of the Constitution. The part that the people said, we won't sign unless you put this in. I am Lynn Stewart. I am 67 years old. I am a lawyer by profession, but now disbarred as a result of being accused, tried, and convicted of aiding terrorism. All of the charges stemmed from my being the lawyer for Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman, who was convicted of terrorism in 1995. And I am now on appeal, but have also spent many, many days, weeks, hours speaking out publicly about the case and what I think the case means to my country and indeed internationally. Constitution is a wonderful document, but we can't assert any of those amendments to the Constitution for bringing contraband and aiding terrorists when they're behind bars. There are some limits, but they're clearly not obvious to everybody. What advice would you give to those lawyers that are getting a message from what they're doing to you? They're not going to scare Stand up. Stand up, be brave. Don't let them tell you what to do. Stand up and be brave. I would agree with Ms. Stewart. But at the same time, it doesn't hurt to obey the law. Now, sometimes we not only get a live news feed, but sometimes our conduct becomes the subject of a caricature presentation, this presentation on television somewhere in Southeast Asia. 
This lawyer didn't bring cupcakes and cakes either. And where he tried to hide what he was bringing into prison may surprise you, and if you're a little bit modest, turn your back at the end of the clip. Prison officer noted the unusually high number of visits Ritesh Brambat paid to inmate David Sterling and arranged a sniffer dog search for his next visit. When informed about the search, Brambat began to look pale and nervous. He was asked to stand still in the search room, arms down. Police found a cell phone with earphones, mephedrone and skunk cannabis inside his oversized shoes and the crotch area of his trousers. You were fair warned. The lesson here is if you're going to bring something into jail, put it someplace other than in your shoe or your crotch area. <laughs> and beware of the sniffing dogs. Here's a story about a lawyer who took his personal and professional responsibilities much further than Carolyn Fairless would expect you to do. He was a little bit too zealous, and we'll see the difficulty that he got into. We need to be zealous. We need to be proactive. But this one is truly over the top. Mexico, a divorce lawyer, is facing jail time after he was caught on tape helping his client take things from the house she once shared with her estranged husband. NBC's Craig Melvin has the story. A punch, a kick, now for this man, a jail sentence. Authorities say the man in the surveillance video is Raymond Van Ornum. He's a divorce lawyer. In the video, you can see a woman trying to get inside the home where she used to live with her now estranged husband. On the windows, a court order and other signs telling her to set up a time to figure out who gets what. Van Arnhem and some employees from his law firm don't wait. The man inside, the estranged husband, Anthony Stone Cipher, decides to leave. Van Arnhem takes the sucker from his mouth to tap on the window. Smile for camera number one and camera number two. Camera number one, camera number two. First, the lawyer and his client head to the backyard. She tries a window, he kicks in the back door. Then he runs into that husband who drove back to the house with a warning. By the way, you're trespassing. Really? Yeah, really. Wow, you should and call 911 oh, right now. Oh, I did. Van Arnhem was convicted on four criminal charges for the October incident. A judge ordered him to pay $5,000 in restitution and spend 30 days in jail. It's not Van Arnhem's first time in trouble with the law. In 2002, he was convicted of cocaine possession and temporarily disbarred. His attorney claimed Van Arnhem was only there with the woman to get things for her baby. We certainly didn't agree with that he had the right to even no trespass, Melissa, from that house. Now, the state Supreme Court is considering permanently disbarring the divorce lawyer caught on tape. Craig Melvin, NBC News, Los Angeles. I don't want to discourage any of you from making house calls. <laughs> but please, not that way. Here's a story about a local boy, New York lawyer, great law firm, uh, 499 Park Avenue, his name on the front door. When our law firm broke into, this is before we, uh, well, I'd like to say before I acquired 950 lawyers in joining Bingham, but when, when our law firm broke in two, one half went with this guy, the other half stayed with me. I'll let you decide who, make the, who made the right choice. How did you end up becoming a crook? I uh, can't remember the moment in which I decided to do something that I knew was wrong. I had an ambition that I needed to feed. I think I fell into the trap of wanting to be more successful than I was. But you were successful. I was, but I really wanted to distinguish myself. I wanted to, you know, wanted to be as important as I thought I was, deserved to be. With degrees from Yale and Harvard Law and the ego of a successful trial lawyer, Dreyer told friends he was going to become a billionaire. He started his own law firm that he said would revolutionize the business of law. He was going to hire the best attorneys, pay them top dollar, and keep all the profits for himself as the firm's only partner. Are you convinced hedge funds to lend money ostensibly to Mr. Solo, your former client, and in fact the money was going to you? Yes. So you came up with phony financial statements, phony audits, forged documents for Mr. Solo's company? Yes. How'd you do all that? How'd you get that stuff? Well, I invented it. What was your biggest deal? Uh, 100 million. Somebody just gave you a hundred million dollars and never bothered to check with your supposed alleged client to make sure that this was on the up and up? Right. 
But I don't know, I guess I heard a long time ago, too, that uh, the more money you look for, the fewer questions people ask sometimes. So you were digging yourself into a hole. Yeah, you know, very much so. You know, you start with something that you think is manageable and small. You know it's wrong, but you think you can fix it, and you, and you can't get out of it. It became quicksand. I had to keep meeting obligations that grew bigger and bigger. Clearly, all along the way, if there was a way for me to have gotten out of it, I, I would have done it. In 2007, Dreyer LLP occupied 10 floors of a Park Avenue building, employed more than 250 lawyers around the country with high-profile clients like Bill Cosby, Andy Pettit, Maria Sharpova, and Justin Timberlake. What no one but Mark Dreyer knew was that the rents, the salaries, and the expenses were all being subsidized by fraud. I recognized in the last couple of years that what I saw as a $20 million mistake had grown into a mistake of a few hundred million dollars. And then I did some increasingly irrational things because I wasn't thinking clearly. Crazy things. Yeah. Desperate. Yeah. He was a, a solid lawyer, and, and there are a number of judges who told me that Mark Dreyer was probably the best lawyer that has ever appeared in front of him. The police in Toronto were called, and Dreyer was arrested for impersonation. When he returned to New York five days later, he was apprehended by the FBI on charges of fraud and money laundering. To the complete and utter astonishment of the New York legal community, yes. ten days after Dreyer's arrest, the law firm bearing his name had declared bankruptcy and 600 people were looking for work. The day we met attorney Joanne Rapuano and longtime office manager Tori Lalonde, the firm's furniture and office equipment were being sold off by the court to pay off the creditors mostly hedge funds and their investors, who are not likely to see much of the missing $400 million. Okay, now we have the paper shredder. <coughs> if this paper shredder could talk, how much of the paper shredder? $25, bit. open it up now. What's it like being here? Truly really tragic. I don't want to compare you with Madoff, but one of the questions that people ask about Madoff constantly is how could he do this? How could he walk around living this life, spending all this money, never showing a crack in the facade. And, and, and there's some similarities, but how did you deal with that? I was doing a lot of things at the same time. I was engaged in a fraud, which took a lot of energy to sustain. But I was also running a law firm, a legitimate law firm, other than obviously the obvious fact that it was funded illegitimately. I was a practicing lawyer. I was handling my own cases in court, which took a lot of energy. I almost didn't have enough time to dwell on the elephant in the room, which was the very you know, the, the, the crime I was engaging with to keep, to keep all this up. I've lost everything I own. I've lost my business. I've obviously lost my reputation. I've caused my family um, obviously enormous unhappiness. And I have nothing. Do you have any friends? Now? Mm -hmm. uh, keep your friends. Keep your family. And don't cross the line. Thank you.